So we're now live. So, Doug, welcome back to Timelines. It's good to have you back. This is a special for the Army-Navy game, which is coming up on 9 December. So this will be out before then. And to say hi to all our classmates, of course. And this is one of the more fun things I do on Timelines. Welcome back. It is great to be back. Uh, it's been an interesting, what uh, what it's been, about, I, about three years since we talked last, I think. Yep. And you know what? My Skype wasn't working tonight, which I normally do the interview with. So we just tried FaceTime recording it on my system. So it's something brand new. We'll see how it works. If you notice, I've got your uh, your picture on the background. You can't see that, but behind you is uh, your picture in, uh, when you did it in episode 34, which is a long time ago. Hey, so what I want to talk about, first of all, a little bit about what you've been doing. It's really interesting. Some advice you can give to the classmates and to other people, maybe with your similar background getting out of the military and in the contracting world. And then finally, um, let's go into the Army-Navy experience and let's keep us bound about 20 minutes. How's that? We could do that. Sure. Sounds good. So tell me about your in public works. I know you were in the reserve, which I think is a great thing to do. Keep your security clearance. You got your uh, security clearance um, vetted last in 2011, but somehow you ended up leaving that nice public works job and contracting. So what's been happening? It was public works for a small border town. It was uh, one of the, actually, the, in the bottom 10% of cities in Texas in terms of uh, per capita income. So it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't paying real well. A fascinating job. I really enjoyed it. Uh, after 28 years in the military, you know, the, the federal government is a system, has a system where everything is, is very well organized and laid out and you have a great safety, you know, plan and you, you have a procurement plan and, and policy and there's ways to keep track of fuel usage and, and everything. And a city, small city, just kind of grew up from a, from a farming community, didn't have a lot of that stuff. And so I was able to go in and make a difference. And that was really cool. Um, what I hated was small city politics. Oh, I can imagine. You know, I was a city councilman before 9-11 for six years. And we just had a discussion about that and about leadership, too. I look back and we, we hired... We fired the first city manager and then hired the city council, hired a new city manager. And I got to help on that. And he'd been a warrant officer in the army and he was just a great city manager. And I think that we talked about the experience he had in the military, being able to relate and associate with him. So I think everyone liked him. He got along well, but he uh, executed with staff as well as the city council. I think a military background would be great for anybody in that kind of a role. Uh, I was actually in the running. I, I was the runner up for the city manager position uh, shortly before I left. Um, they actually hired uh, a lady who had been in the city her whole life and had a lot, honestly, to give her credit, probably had a lot more passion for, for running things in the city than I would have as much as I enjoyed it and as much as I thought I could have done a great job. Uh, she kind of came up through the HR role and she was very good at what she did. Um, loves the city of Socorro, Texas. And is doing great. I, I just wish her well. She beat me out for the job. But uh, 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 if you ever hear this, Andrea, just uh, I, I know you're going to do great. Uh, I know you are doing a great thing over there. And I don't envy you that uh, the politics I see going on. <laughs> well, it's tough. One thing is I think the average city manager lasts from about three to four years. So it's like your final job, but that's why you get paid the big bucks. And hopefully you get some money when you're retire or get fired as <laughs> city manager. Yeah. 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 It's tough. It's a tough business. I think after I left, the city manager was actually fired, which he shouldn't have been, but that's just the way it goes. New city council comes in and right. all right. those different things. It was only one vote off. You know, it only takes like uh, seven city council members. It takes four votes when I'm being the mayor. It, it uh, It's a fact yeah. of American politics that nobody's ever satisfied a hundred percent. Yeah. And so there's always a, a faction that, that doesn't like whoever's in power right now, and it, it, you're going to move around. So yeah. what have you been doing the last two years? Back to life. Uh, last year, I, I had a great job on the East Coast uh, running a facilities management contract for Homeland Security. Um, that was interesting, but it was a small company and didn't really work out as a long-term job. Uh, they moved me up, and then they moved me to halftime, and, and that just wasn't paying the bills. So I came back. Um, Came back to Colorado, and I was working as a uh, as a construction manager for an Indian tribe. That was really fascinating. Just a whole different culture. The uh, Native Americans have such a a respect for family and for for their cultural heritage. 
I mean, we think we have a great culture, you know, the U.S. and movies and science and, and everything we do culturally. But it means so much more for an Indian tribe. And I, I kind of tried to immerse myself in that. I was taking language lessons. I was going to the dances, the, the, not that I could dance or anything, but on the weekends just so I could appreciate the, the culture and heritage. And I loved it. Fascinating. Uh, but again, that was another small, small tribe on the border. Not a lot of uh, money. It was, and when something more lucrative came along, I, I jumped at the chance. I've moved around, I will admit, in jobs a lot uh, since I got out of the Army. And that's given me a broad range of experiences and opened the world up to me. And I, I, I've i been fascinated by that. But I realize that not everybody is into that. Some people like to stick with the same job for <laughs> for their whole life. And that's really cool, too. I, you know, I, I, in a sense, I, I wish I could, could have done that, too. But um, jumping around, experiencing a lot of different things. I'm working for FEMA now. We're uh, helping rebuild East Texas. Uh, Working public assistance, which is uh, public uh, municipalities, uh, public organizations, some nonprofits, rebuilding roads, rebuilding libraries, rebuilding a symphony hall down in uh, down in Houston. Um, I, I'm doing some good for the world, and it's a great job. It's a fascinating job. You know that is good. How, but how about the family? What's it like? You're traveling, right? I, uh, since I since I remarried in 2008. This is my fourth job away from town. Uh, um, and when we got married, we didn't actually live together for two years, believe wow. it or not. It was because uh, we would get together monthly, one way or another. She would travel to me, would meet halfway, something. Um, so we do long distance uh, really well. We talk multiple times a day. We Skype uh, every evening yeah. together, FaceTime. So, And uh, she's been out here once to meet, spend a long weekend with me. I'm looking forward to seven days uh, home for Christmas. We we do long distance pretty well. You know, we didn't used to have those things when we were young officers. Oh, gee. <laughs> I was in Korea for a year, and I remember a phone call was $17, one of them. Uh, uh, just about the same calling home from, from Germany. Yeah. So yeah. I remember those days. Yeah, Or, or waiting, you know, uh, 10 days for a letter. Yeah. My yeah. son is a lieutenant in the Coast Guard in Puerto Rico, and he got married uh, about six months ago. And they evacuated all the dependents. And he was just complaining about not being able to see her and all the different oh, issues. Yeah. And coming back to the island. And uh, I said, now you got Skype, you got phone calls. But, you know, your mom and I were gone so many times. And I went back in the Army for five years. And I was at Leavenworth, and they stayed back in California. So I can relate. Back in the Army after your Air Force time? Yeah, I did Army, <laughs> Army 9, and then Air National Guard, and then uh, back in the Army trying to finish up my active duty. And I loved it. I went back in civil affairs. I love civil affairs. It was a perfect fit. I was still aviation branch because they wouldn't let me out of aviation branch, but I was controlled by civil affairs. Fascinating. Yeah. I loved it. I loved civil affairs. It was, it, was, it was engineering and just working with the people and the government. It was just uh, uh, mostly of Afghanistan. And I went Most of my reserve time was in the uh, was in a training unit, but civil affairs was my second choice. Oh, I loved it. If you can get, I, if I had to do it again, uh, I would have. As soon as I got after duty, I probably would have stayed on active duty. I was in the one sixtieth, but I would have definitely got into civil affairs a lot sooner. I, I like the Air National Guard. I like the Air Force, but it was just really good to be back in the Army and especially civil affairs. They're two different two different organizations. I I don't know if I, we mentioned it last time, but I worked for the Air Force. Yeah. As an exchange officer for a year, and and that was a, as much of a cultural event as going to to Germany or Korea. Hey, before we go on to talk about the Army Navy game, one little bit of advice. What advice do you have to some of our classmates who are retired now, either retired from the Army or they've done a combination like I have? What, what advice would you give for them now if they if they want to go work or do other things, and maybe their kids are growing up? You know, working for FEMA. FEMA is a seasonal job, and so uh, we don't have a whole lot of folks here who are full time, and that means it's a perfect job for retirees because you come do it for three months, six months, and then you you know take a couple years off. Um, if you just need a little time away from the boredom of retirement, um, or you know a little financial boost for for six months, it's a great way to do it. When I was going through training up in uh, in Maryland on my way here, 
I, I told my wife the average age of all the people here is Doug. Wow. So there, yeah, we had, we had eight, 70 and 80 year olds in the class. We had a couple 20 and 30 year olds in the class. So it was, it was pretty cool, pretty different, certainly different than the army to see a couple of guys with walkers on their way to, to, to a job with you. Wow. So, I guess we're not in Afghanistan. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Doug was in Afghanistan the same time I was. I, our paths used to cross all over the place. We'd hardly, we see each friends, but not each other. Saw the uh, the son of a classmate was as close as I got to to um, anything like that over there. Yeah, I mean, I think I we just missed each other. I saw you at uh, at Kaya. I was at Kaya for quite a long. That's Kabul International Airport. I I did not get up to the northeast at all. I was. Down I thought you went in there once. Well. Nope, uh, Kandahar was nope. as close as I got to to being northeast, and that's pretty pretty. Okay, southwest. maybe we didn't. Okay. So so anyway, we're doing our thing over there, bouncing around, seeing classmates. So. Yep. Hey, yeah, so, I worked with Brett Dalton and uh, and Rich. Yeah, I tried to get Brett in the human train team system. Yeah. I was in the, both in, in uniform and as a GS, so it was a good good gig. Awesome. Good, good stuff. Okay. So let's go yeah. on. Let's take a second break. We're going to break for a second. Say, say break. Break. Hi, this is Bill, and this is a break on timelines of 3 December 2017. I want to give a little, quick little update what we're doing at the National Association of Podcasters. We've done our first round, and we're starting to build an organization, gave away a few tickets for the national conference uh, coming up in October of 2018. And uh, we decided, uh, talking to the board and other folks, is to really push it, building about 1,000 life members, and then go to more of an annual membership after that. To get 1,000 life memberships to get it going and start the price really low. So what we've done is um, in the National Association, of course, built the front page. And here's a price, one to find it. So if you go to um, the front page of the naop.us and you can go there and just hit join, it'll come up right here and uh, you'll find your pricing. So for the first 30 people, and we're not going to be pushing this a lot, you'll just hear it right now in a couple different places, like on the podcast. It's five dollars. Then uh, for the first one hundred, it goes up to about seven. But eventually, that's going to go to one ninety-two, and I think our final price is projected to be about two thirty-seven for life membership. These are all founding members. Uh, you'll get thirty um, percent uh, off of tickets to the conference. Plus, you'll have access to the Quick Start Podcast Course and the Advanced Podcast Course. So it's a good deal. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the National Association of Podcasters. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call and if I don't answer leave your uh, your phone number and I'll call you back and that's 775-527-4276 well now without further ado let's get back to the show and if you're watching this uh, like on the National Association of Podcasters Life Membership sign on page this is just a quick little uh, ad for the week of 3 December Go Army Beat Navy Okay, we're coming back from our break. Army beat Navy. Huh? <laughs> beat Navy. So anyway, coming back, uh, finishing up with your family real fast. You've got a fairly large family, I would say. You know, um, I don't think of them as large because it is a blended family. And we've actually never put all my kids together with her kids at the in the same room at the same time. But um, she's got uh, two daughters and two sons. And between them, they've got six grandkids for us. I've got five children. Um, and let me count as uh, seven grandkids on my side so far. So that's a dozen. God, that keeps you busy. Uh, and one on the way. So, so that's 13, 13, 14, depending on how you count. Well, we've got one in the Coast Guard who's Who's one on the way there, but that's, <laughs> I, I love spoiling grandkids. I can, you know, I, I go to visit, I immediately get down on the floor and start crawling around on my hands or oh, I can see that. grabbing them and putting them on my lap to read a book or asking them about their favorite game and getting in into them with them. Or, um, I, I don't know, for some reason I relate real well at the fourth, four and five year old level. Regression going back. Still, yeah. That's stress from West Point, I think. Yeah. Hey, so driving on, tell me about. Your um your experience with the Navy goat. It was let me see. It would have been uh, cow year, so we were we were juniors, 
I was rooming with Donnie Reeves, um, great guy, special forces. I would love to know what Don is up to nowadays. I, I understand he's working in Indonesia and hasn't been back to the States in a long time. And, and uh, it's sad we lost track of him because Don was a fascinating guy. Uh, but he pulled me into my room and checked for bugs. And I'm going, Don, what are you doing? And I, he was just kind of – he was messing around. But then he, he pulled me aside and said, we're going to go steal the Navy Guild. And I said, what? No, we can't – well uh, – and, and the idea kind of grew on me. And uh, actually, he and his, his brother, who was class of 81, were uh, – had planned it. And his brother's friend, maybe roommate Jack Smith. So Garen Reeves, Don Reeves, Jack, and myself – um, this was probably a, a month before we actually did it. So it probably would have been, uh, early mid October. Uh, and they asked me to, to procure a vehicle, which was really weird because I didn't have my, my driver's license yet. And I didn't know what to do. Um, but as it got closer and closer, I, I knew I was on the, the Academy wrestling team, never wrestled a varsity match, but I was on the team for, for four years. And so I knew coach had a, had a good, reliable, beat up old pickup truck. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> and you got a, you got a gymnast in the family too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Pretty awesome. We're a um, pretty active family. There you go. Um, so yeah, coach had a, had a truck uh, a couple days before the big weekend when we were headed, headed South to Annapolis. I said, Hey coach, we're moving some stuff this weekend. Is there any way, you know, I could borrow your truck for the weekend. I didn't mention I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story in itself that you never got your driver's license until what, so, your senior year? I was, you know, to get into West Point, you had to be really active in sports and stuff. And I was just too busy doing everything else to, to get a license. I drove tractor on the farm since I was eight years old, you know, but and I could drive just fine. Just never got around to, to doing it uh, until it came time to get my first car. And then, of course, it became a priority. Anyway, um, so the big weekend came. We all had put in for for passes so we could get out of there on uh, on Friday. Yeah, what was it? No, I, th I think it was Saturday after class we took off. Um, went down to the post engineer's office and signed out bolt cutters, thinking ahead there. Um, uh, Garen had bought a whole bunch of rope. Uh, we needed something for the road, and I convinced everybody we we're just going to sub shop at the PX. Uh, bought eight subs, threw them behind the uh, seat in the truck, crammed four guys into the uh, into the front seat of a pickup truck, so it was a little tight. And for a long drive down to Annapolis, and we we headed out. Got down there before taps, and we were uh, one of my classmates in a three was a exchange cadet down there. So Ken Healy was our spy in the enemy's camp, and Ken um, Ken was supposed to find out the location of the Navy goat for us. And what he told us was, is it's, a, it's at the Naval Academy dairy farm. Okay, where's that? Uh, he had no idea. So, so it really wasn't that helpful. We walked around the campus there for a while and asked random midshipmen, where is the Naval Academy dairy farm? We got a couple... Why are you from Army going to steal the goat? <laughs> uh, and I think what we finally did was ask a plebe, and, you know, in a very authoritative tone. We said, "Mister, where is the Naval Academy Dairy Farm?" He gave us the uh, the address, um, and we we took off. It was one of those roads that happens on the East Coast, where it, you know it's it's Tenth Street, and then it becomes Washington Avenue. And then it becomes Farm Road 1007. And so we wandered around probably two hours trying to find Farm Road 1007. We couldn't find it because we could find Washington Street and, uh, and 10th Avenue. Um, and, of course, this is for mail, so we're not going to stop and ask for directions. But we finally broke down at, at, at some point and, and did do that. And they told us, yeah, Washington Street turns into Farm Road 1007. So, um we rode out there and finally came to the the, uh, the farm. I was ready to get out and go go grab a goat, but this being a military group, we had to recon first. So we sent one guy in, and Garen was gone, and he was gone, and he was gone, and we're we're like thinking, okay, he's been caught or something. No, maybe we ought to go in after him. What are we going to do? You know, we're sitting in the back of the truck talking really quietly, 
And finally, he shows back up. It, it just had taken him a while to find the pen and confirm that there was the goat in there. Uh, this being a military operation, we didn't just go get the goat. We drove down the road. Everybody put on black clothing. We did an operations order. We did a nice five-paragraph field order um, and went back, and we got the goat. Pulled out the bolt cutters, cut the, the lock on the gate. And I didn't know it until weeks after, but Garen had kept the lock and he gave us all a little piece of the, the lock for the Naval Academy goat. And I kept that for maybe 20 or 30 years. I don't know if I still have. It was in my lockbox. Do you still have your lockbox? From, I do. I do still have it. I can, in fact, it's just in the other room. I oh, know it's back here. I think mine still has, has a little piece of uh, the, the lock from the, uh, the goat pen at the Naval Academy dairy farm. Now, I had grown up on a farm, so I was also the designated goat handler. And it, that, goats are small. It had big, wide, let me see, okay, big, horns. wide horns, but it, it wasn't really aggressive, and it was no problem to throw a rope around its neck and kind of half pull it, half carry it out to the truck. Pickup trucks are not really the right vehicle for hauling goats. You you want to put them in, in something with tall sides. Um, so we basically hogtied that poor goat just so it would not hop out of the back of the truck while we're heading down the highway. That would have been bad. bad. Oh yeah. You'd probably get in trouble for killing the Navy goat. Yeah. We would have gotten bad <laughs> trouble for, for <laughs> yeah, that, uh, national level incident there. Um, we did stop for gas on the way and somebody noticed we had a goat in the back and we <laughs> just, because it was so cool and we needed a really good excuse for having a hogtied goat in the back. We told him what it was and, and he thought it was pretty cool. This was like 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, um, don't call the police. <laughs> please. Jack had a girlfriend in Cooperstown. That's kind of a ways. It's an hour and a half, maybe from West Point, two hours from West Point up in central New York, uh, who lived on a farm and whose family had volunteered to keep the goat uh, until we were ready to present it to the Corps. And uh, <laughs> so we took it up there. And I, that's when I got the pictures. And those pictures have, have uh, I don't know, I wish I had taken more pictures as a cadet because it's so great looking back on that stuff. And having two pictures of us with the Naval Academy goat is just so meaningful to me. Um, I have Pretty so cool. few pictures from that time. I just like, what was I, what was I doing? I wasn't taking I pictures. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I, I don't remember why we didn't bring it to the uh, to the core right away, but um, of course we went back Sunday night to to and signed in from from uh, being on pass. And of course, you just done the coolest thing you're ever going to do as a cadet, and you can't wait to tell somebody. But on the other hand, if word gets out, you can get in a lot of trouble for doing this. Do you remember the commandant calling us all, the whole corps, into I call auditorium and talking to us about he had made a promise to <laughs> his counterpart at the Naval Academy that he, they wouldn't do anything like that? I read that. I think it was because of the class of 77 or something. I, I was reading about that the other day. I do remember it, too. Um, and, of course, we're sitting there. What do we do? You know, if, you know this could mean our, and it was missing. our career if we get caught with this. Well, the Navy goat was missing, too. I, I think it's great that you made him sweat a little bit, the Navy. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And the other really, really cool thing is – I couldn't believe it when, when Don said we made Sports Illustrated and there was just a little half a sentence in that, that you know, I don't know if you remember, at the back of Sports Illustrated used to have little local, really cool sports stories. And there was half a sentence there about something about just like this year when the cadets of Army stole Navy's goat, <laughs> something like that. No credit for us individually. Nah, Darn. it's okay. But it was still us. We knew it. When we made Sports Illustrated, that was pretty cool. Um, coach took a while to notice that we'd put over 700 miles on his truck to move some stuff <laughs> over the weekend. And practice got pretty hard for me for a little while. Wrestling. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, wrestling, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we, we did – I don't remember what we did that first year. We did take it up on the poop deck, uh, show it to the core somehow. And this was shortly after that lecture from the commandant. So what we did was 
spirit the goat away again for a couple hours and in the middle of the night tied it in the commandant's backyard. So and he had to go. <laughs> it was his problem getting it back to the Naval Academy. I have no idea how that happened, but the goat was on the field uh, during the, the Army Navy game. I don't remember whether we even won or lost that year. Do you? We won in 77. That's the only year we won. Not 77. Yeah. Uh, our, our yearling year. Yeah, yearling year. That would have been our 77, yeah. yeah. It was 76, I think, they sold a goat. I can't remember exactly when the – I think it was 76 they stole the goat. <coughs> Hard to track at all, but it was 77 is the only year we won. I remember how cold it was and I had core frames on. <coughs> they actually went back and did it again the second year, but unfortunately I was, I was uh, on room, con, room confinement – serving some kind of slug for something. I think I had lent my car as a first tee to a, a yearling who parked it in a really obvious stupid area. <laughs> um, and so I got slugged for that. And of course he got slugged for it too. Um, Worst and I, part. I was really worried that, well, I couldn't get a pass. That's what it was because I was serving room con. Um, as but a they brought the goat, they brought, brought the goat back and kept it. Yeah. As a first, well, as, and since I was on course squad, um, they brought the goat back and I think they kept it in Garrison or one of the other closer towns that year. And I didn't go actually help steal the goat when I was a firstie, but I did, uh, get to make the announcement when they put it on the poop deck. We brought it in, um, just at, you know, it's late fall. So it's dark when we're marching to dinner and, um, the march to dinner brought the goat in and up to the top of Washington Hall, uh, waited until the adjutant had done the announcements. Then we uh, we snuck down. You can get, you know, to the poop deck from above in Washington Hall or from below uh, on the floor of the uh, the mess hall. We locked the door of the uh, leading out to the mess hall so that the brigade staff or OC couldn't come get us and brought the goat down from the from the roof. Made the announcement, held up the goat. Uh, I made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, the Corps of Cadets is proud to have as its guest for the evening meal, the Navy Goat! Ah! And, okay. Hopefully I think I remember that like it was yesterday. That was really, that was, you know, that was I, the. I remember right where I was sitting, where I was down, like what the where the mural is. I was halfway down the mural area looking up at you guys. And I think we ran over to the other side of the poop deck and held the goat up uh, there, and then ran yeah. up to the uh, ran up to the to the top of Washington Hall, tied it on the roof, and I think that year we, you know, at about two a.m., tied the goat in the superintendent's backyard. <laughs> it was his problem to get it back to the Naval Academy. We didn't need, have to worry about that. We were a lot better at keeping quiet that second year. Um, but we know we did it, and and it was a it was the defining moment I, of our. I would have liked to seen good, General Good Pastor calling. Uh, the, <laughs> people came. We got something of yours. Oh yeah. <laughs> Want to yeah. send a boat up the Hudson? It was uh, uh, that. So that was that was a fabulous, fabulous time as a cadet. That um, I did an awful lot of stuff. I I, I like staying active still. Uh, you know, I did I did musical things. I did. Uh, I did a, a huge science project, including a, a presentation in Carlisle. Um, but stealing the goat was, was, was pretty much the coolest thing you could do as a cadet. So that's cool. That's a good story. So as we, the ninth is coming up, that's good. Good to touch base with you, Doug. Let's make sure you get back on before like two or three years. Maybe I'll, oh, yeah. maybe I'll run into you. I've got a, I was going to say in closing, well, in closing, you're doing a lot of neat stuff. We had a lot of great time. You know what? There were times at West Point that were pretty darn good, especially the last couple of years. Oh, absolutely. I'd do it again. A lot. Of, oh, I would too. I do it a little differently. I wouldn't take Chinese though. <laughs> <laughs> so. Meow. Yeah, no. Nina. No. Bujo Dao. I haven't talked in a while. I, I okay. put, I've worked on my French though. So anyway, I appreciate it, Doug. I will uh, absolutely. We'll sign off. Don't leave. Uh, stay on for a second and let me shut okay. this down. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for listening to this episode of Timelines. If you could go right here and subscribe on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, and watch a few more movies over here. And if you're listening to on iTunes, go ahead and subscribe. Appreciate it very much, rating and review. Till next time, take care and always make it a great day.